You know, I'm, I'm very involved in fundraising uh, for God's work, firstly through prayer and then through communication, you know, what the needs are. And I'm certainly looking for people that say, hey, uh, if you're lacking money, let me know. We'll, we'll make up the difference. Let me just assure you, they are hard to find. Most of my friends seem to be broke or missionaries and need money, much less able to give. Radical grace, increasing in wisdom, growing in your faith. Often because we feel condemned by some sinful practice in our life or wrong attitudes or lack of love, we, we, we want that quick fix. And we often rush to conferences where we hear maybe people are being healed or we may, maybe people are being blessed. I'm not against those things. But any crisis you have in your Christian life, and I've had a few, that's not followed by a process will soon be an abscess. People wonder, why is George Verwer taking all these meetings? Is he just trying like to raise money? Or is he just recruiting for OM? Those things may be there. I take meetings because I love people. I love to see them saved. I love to see them going on. And I know the path for young believers. It's rough and it's tough. They will have failure. They will have discouragement. And so a lot of my life, I'm there on the email. I'm there on the phone for the moment when people are discouraged. Their father's just died. Maybe their wife has just loved them. We preached a radical message 50 years ago and were highly criticized for it. We preached that divorced people could be used in global missions. No mission at that time was accepting glorious divorced people. I couldn't see that in the Bible. In the first ship that I bought, I had a fantastic captain. He was one of these guys, just a top guy, single guy, total big future in the P&O line. He left it all to become my captain before I had a ship. By the way, he later married a woman from Cardiff. And uh, her father was uh, Captain Morgan, a famous uh, pilot uh, here on your, uh, on your port. But uh, Graham, and God used him to help pioneer the ship project. Just before we actually bought the ship, he felt God was speaking to him. Graham was the kind of person, when he felt God was speaking to him, it did not matter anymore what George Furwer had to say. And so he stepped out of the ship ministry, later became the director of OM in the UK. So I had to go to my first officer. He was a Norwegian. He was a Norwegian Pentecostal, who I found out was persecuted by his church because he's through divorce. And he sort of had to keep that quiet. Even though his divorce was before he was even a believer. He was also a drunk. Oh, you don't hold that against him. And he was a drunken sea captain, which you wouldn't want to go on his ship out there in Indonesia. And he got wonderfully saved, but his marriage broke. And so he said to me, when I said, you got to now be captain of the ship, he said, I can't be the captain, though you know I'm divorced. I said, well, yeah, I know that. He said, well, I said, well, you know, show me a verse in the Bible that says divorced people can't be captain of a ship. And he couldn't find the Bible verse. And so Bjorn Christian, not only was he the captain of our ship, he met this amazing English woman on our ship, a nurse who was so different from him. They might as well have come in from different planets and they fell in love and they had a fantastic marriage. They're both celebrating in heaven. Radical grace is the strongest message in the whole Bible. We're saved by grace. Since we're saved by grace, we now must practice grace. Jesus made it clear. If you're not willing to forgive others, then why should you be forgiven? You know that verse? And so one of the most important things in our life is just forgiving everybody that's done terrible things against us. Many young people today have been hurt by their own parents. You know, that's normal. All parents are sinners. All parents have fallen short of the glory of God. Even if they're Christians, even if they know Jesus, they're still sinners. They still sin. They still fail. And if your parents have hurt you, you need to forgive them. Doesn't mean you'll agree with them. Doesn't even mean you necessarily want to go back and live with them. But when you go to bed at night, your parents are forgiven because Jesus Christ has forgiven you. And before the living God, before you knew Jesus, before you were covered with the blood of Christ, you were 10 times more guilty than you thought. Your own ego made you, even in those days, made me feel at least there was something there. When the Bible says, <laughs> in this flesh, there dwelleth no 
good thing. Bit of a mystery because of God. God, in his providence, works in the accomplishment of his purposes, even through those that don't know Jesus. I wonder if you have these two, two main streams of biblical truth functioning in your life. Radical discipleship. Jesus is Lord. Many of you put your hand up last night to just say, Lord, I'm available. That's, that's similar to saying, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord over my time, my talent, my money. And when we pray that prayer, radical grace, other verses in the word of God, turn the lights on and make us realize this is going to take time. This is going to take time. This is not a matter of a weekend conference. This is not a matter of four men of God laying their hands on on your head and praying uh, for you to live a godly life. This is going to be a lifelong pilgrimage. Have you read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? And one of the things that's encouraged me the most, because I wrestle a lot of discouragement, and I really get fed up with myself, and much more And when I was a younger Christian and I didn't understand grace and how God uh, would forgive me. When I was a young Christian, I was still infatuated with so many different girls. Some of them now are Christians. And I just found life so complicated. What I was supposed to do and not supposed to do. I was big into dancing. I just loved to dance. And uh, then somebody, a Christian said, well, Christians don't dance. What do Christians do, actually? (laughs) Oh, they go to church. (laughs) And I remember once, uh, before I went to Moody Bible Institute, I was at Liberal Arts College, like first year at university. And I hitchhiked a long distance to see this particular girl that really, really uh, was in my mind. And when I got there a long ways away, um, she was busy. She had a boyfriend. So I tried to just overcome this little heartbreak and I went into the streets. It's a true story, giving out tracts, you know. I'm a disciple. I don't need that girl anyway. I'm serving Jesus. I'm giving out tracts and trying to witness. And then suddenly I'm I'm right in front of this place, which was a big thing back in the late 50s. Uh, We call it a striptease place where you, you go in and there's dancing girls, pole dancers, and they take off all their clothes. Now, in my town where I lived, We didn't have any place like that. Even when I was into porno, there was no place like that around my town, or I saw probably would have been in there, but probably not because afraid somebody would see me. But now I'm in a strange city. Nobody's going to see me. So one minute I'm giving out tracts praising Jesus. The next minute I'm in this place watching this incredible woman that blew every circuit in my sexual head, you know, take off all of her clothes. And, And suddenly I'm convicted this is probably not the best place for God's disciple. And I ran out of there feeling so bad and ran into a telephone booth like the kind we we used to have, the red phone booths. We we still have a few of them, don't we? So I ran into a phone booth and I picked up the phone. I said, God, are you there? I'm in trouble. I didn't hear any answer. (laughs) So uh, somehow... Even though I was young and a struggler, somehow I understood grace. That God still loved me. That was stupid. It was sinful. But he would forgive me. And I, I just went out of that phone booth. I knew I was forgiven. I was God's child. Though part of me didn't feel it. Part of me still felt dirty. So I'm standing in a bus station. Now, in a bus station, when someone comes up to you, they usually ask, or a coach station, you know, where's the coach to Edinburgh or Where's the bus to Chicago? But this man came up to me, and I'm not exaggerating, with one or two minutes, without me saying hardly anything, he said, what must I do to be saved? Hello? Have you ever had that? In the rail station in Britain or the coach station? He, He was in torment because seemingly his wife had come to Jesus. He didn't understand what was going on. It looked like the marriage was gonna break. And he said, what must I do? To be saved probably was trying to say, what must I do to, you know, get my wife back? And I had the joy sometime later there at that famous war memorial in Indianapolis of leading this man to salvation in Jesus. You know, the devil, first of all, wanted me in that place. 
and, and sell out to him and follow his plan. Secondly, the devil maybe wanted me just groveling in the phone booth, totally in, unable to forgive myself. Or getting into, what's the use? There's no, no hope for me. Go have a glass of beer and a whiskey and forget the whole mess. But somehow, because of radical grace, I was able to get through that failure. Brothers and sisters, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why are we surprised when we discover all these politicians are misusing money, are sleeping around with different young girls working in their office? Why are we surprised when these things get into the newspaper that this famous television guy from 40 years ago abused more than 30 different women during his famous career? As Christians, we're not surprised because this is a rebellious planet, because the heart is evil and desperately wicked. And without Jesus Christ and his transforming grace, then, of course, as A.W. Tozer said, and many of his books are on that table at an unbelievable price, the whole world is an emergency area. Nothing is right until it's put right by the redeeming grace of the radical Jesus. And I want to just encourage you with all my heart. Follow him for the long run. And when you fall, it's real easy what to do when you fall. Get up. Don't lay there. Suppose when it's raining, I think it occasionally rains in Wales, and when it's raining and there's some kind of a mud puddle, what, what if you're out running in the morning? I try to run uh, or walk, power walking every day. And what if you fall into a mud puddle? What would you do? Oh, I'm here in the mud puddle. I'm going to stay here. Yeah, roll around in it. Yeah, maybe try to swim. It would be shallow water swimming there in the mud puddle in the middle of Cardiff. Somebody might get a picture, put it on Facebook. No, you're not that stupid. Some of you look a little bit, you know, but uh, get up, get cleaned, and get on with wherever you have to go. The same way in the Christian life, when you fall into some of the devil's mud, you make a mistake. And for me, that includes wrong attitude. I still have very high goal. Radical grace doesn't mean you lower your goal. But it, it means that you, knew, you, you know what to do when you fail. You know what to do when you sin. You get up. You get clean. You recognize who you are in Jesus. And you get back into the battle. As far as I know, that man is on his way to heaven that I met in the bus station that day because I wasn't in place number one and I wasn't in the phone booth number two. I got back into the action. That's why I've never missed since my conversion. I've never missed a day serving Jesus. Not because I'm something. Not because I'm the great radical disciple of the 20th, 21st century. No, because of grace, because of Jesus, because of forgiveness, because he uses needy, struggling Doubting Thomas, borderline agnostics, to love him and serve him. I wish my friend who I've just spent two hours with, one of my favorite Welsh friends, I wish Lindsey Brown were here speaking instead of me. Then you'd have it in your own accent. I remember meeting Lindsey at Oxford University. He's the president of the Christian Union. The moment I met him, I knew he was different. I knew God's hand was on him. My wife and I were there that weekend and something happened at a Christian union that I never experienced and I've spoken at more than most people. They celebrated our wedding anniversary at the CU meeting and gave us a cake. I don't think my wife ever forgot it. And this redheaded Welshman made an impact on me. I've now followed him. I was at his wedding for 40 years. And the way I've seen God use this brother, Lindsey Brown, all over the world is just staggering to my imagination. He reminded me that his final year at university was on our ship where his honors degree wasn't exactly recognized. And when he was put down in the hold of the ship, lugging books and doing manual labor uh, part of the time during his year traveling on our ship, Lagos. Then later became the traveling sect for Wales, which his son Owen now does. And then uh, he became the European leader of uh, that whole student movement, and then he became the international executive director of the whole global IFES, or global student movement. He reminded me this morning, he only got into Oxford on a rugby scholarship. 
didn't even know Oxford offered any rugby scholarships, and certainly I would not have received one. God works in all kinds of people in amazing ways. And we need, we need to decide when we're young, we're going to get it together. We're going to get it together. Whatever our problem is, our struggle, our hurt, we're somehow going to get it together and learn how to live a life that manifests Jesus and that can bounce back and that can handle the heartbreaks and the disappointments that life is so full of. Radical grace, radical discipleship. Here's an interesting book called Total Abandon. How do we get this book? Gary Witherwall is an Englishman, and he's in one of these churches that doesn't believe in things like Operation Mobilization. So we didn't get much encouragement to come on OM, but he came, and he had his life transformed. And when he went back to his church, of course, like many churches, and I don't hold that against him, we're all different. Uh, They they, they felt, well, we're not going to really stand with you if you're not going to just, you know, get involved here in in our church. This is what God's doing here. And, you know, if you get involved here, I'll, uh, you know, we'll support you. But if you're going to get this OM thing and he wanted to go to Bible college in America, that's anathema. And so it was a tough decision for him to follow God and leave some of those friends sort of behind. He went to Chicago. He graduated from Moody, and God gave him this amazing wife, Bonnie Witherall. And they went as ambassadors of Jesus Christ to Lebanon, and she was martyred. She was shot dead in front of the clinic. And that's the book that came out of that horrible story. And yet through that crisis, and he stood by her body, and pronounced forgiveness on the one who had committed the crime. That doesn't mean there would be no justice. But he got radical grace to forgive those that murdered his own wife. I hope someday he could come here and speak. Through this incident, we discovered he's in the top 10 communicators we've ever had in the whole history of OM. He soon was going all over the world, sharing this story, sometimes to situations where I had never even been invited. Hallelujah. And then this book, Total Abandon. Uh, came out. After some years, God gave him another wife. He's now the leader of the Transform Movement. And if you're possibly free next summer, join Gary Witherall there in Rome in this Transform Movement. Richard, over by the big OM sign, can tell you about Transform and what's going on there next summer. Here's another book. It has a powerful message of radical grace. It's a book by a woman named Debbie Meroff, a close friend It's called True Grit, nothing to do with John Wayne and the film. And it's all about women. This is the most influential book in my life, really, in the last 10 years. Because before that, I was mainly discipleship, proclamation, world evangelism, uh, church planting, you know, everything connected with that. But 10 years ago, through books like this, I began to realize Christians, we are good Samaritans. We have got to be concerned about those laying by the side of the road. And so I I started to read more widely. And this book came into my life, showing what women are suffering in domestic violence, in rape, in the sex traffic industry, in so many horrendous things. Women are suffering. But at the same time, the book showed what women are doing to stand against these great tsunamis of evil that break out across the world. And I just praise the Lord. I've had the privilege, together with others, of distributing 100,000 copies of this book. We hope you'll revisit, especially the free book table. Look at the mountain of books free of charge. I don't want to go back to England and tell them that Welsh people, you can't even give them a present. They refuse gifts. They're so proud. They heard I was from London, and so they wouldn't take my gifts. I don't want to report that when I do main BBC news uh, in the morning, which I'm not doing, like speaking in a small church in Trowbridge. But I want you to go there and just take some more books. They'll give you a bag and give them away. Give them away with my greetings. Tell them to go into my website or just Google my name, georgeverber.com, because... 
I have a lot more time now for prayer as I gave up the leadership of the movement over 10 years ago. And I want to pray for people. I want to encourage young people. I want to send them books. If they don't read, I'll send them films. I give away thousands of films. There's a film over there. It's, I'm not going to tell you about it because it should have a price tag on it. It's a, it costs me a lot of money. And so I'm not going to mention the name October Baby, that film that's over there on the table. This is not a little tame Christian film in which you hear a testimony. Praise God for those films. This is a raw story of an amazing woman and what she went through when she discovered the people she thought were her parents, huh? They were not her parents. And she freaked out big time. You can take October Baby and show it to the most cursing, vile, sleep with every different woman at night person in your college and that film will make an impact. I believe in Christian films and good values film uh, like this one. I even believe in Thor. I mean, I just took my grandkids to see the final thing of Thor. He's now my new hero. I mean, if I could have just a little bit of that power at my meetings, I'd get much bigger crowds, but somehow I guess I better stick with what I have. You know, God is just doing so many amazing things in the world today. I hope a few of you will uh, pick up our little OM Global leaflet with a picture of our new international director. Isn't that amazing? Chinese. A Chinese brother is the international director, a dear friend, and that's his picture. He's only two or three months in the job. He's probably already tossing and turning in bed, screaming for mercy, but I'm sure you will pray for Lawrence Tong. Here's an amazing book about how to share your faith with Muslims. Beware of the Muslim phobia that, you know, we think every Muslim is a terrorist. They're a tiny percentage. You know, in the United States, we have 100,000 who belong to the neo-Nazi movement. My own wife's brother belonged to that movement. He was ready to do the most violent things against the government. But that's not the average American. There are 100,000 in the land of 300 million. But they can do harm. And extremist, fanatic Muslims are a tiny percentage. Their greatest opposition, huh, comes from other Muslims. Doesn't, Christians are often indifferent. They don't know what's going on. Praise God for every exception. And so when you meet Muslims, befriend them. And this book, Friendship First, you can get it for even 25 pence. Uh, ordinary Christians discussing good news with ordinary Muslims. Some of you in present-day Britain, you need Muslim friends. You need to be open to talking with them. And Muslims are coming to Jesus because Islam is totally legalistic. It's very similar to old-fashioned, old-fashioned, hyper, double-barreled, you know, American fundamentalism. They've actually been compared. And so the message of grace and forgiveness, they have massive immorality among them. They have huge abuse of women. But none of these things can be talked about. Iran claims they don't have HIV in the whole of Iran. And we come with this radical message of love, grace, personal salvation, yet holiness. And Sufi Muslims especially are very committed to holy living, very legalistic. They have nothing to do with violence. A massive movement within Islam called Sufism. We have a thousand workers among Muslims in Operation Mobilization. We may have learned a little bit in 52 years of working among them. And we believe the message they need is radical grace. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. One of the greatest things that happened to me in my first one or two years when I, after I accepted the Lord, which I told you about last night, I had the privilege of leading friends to Jesus. And I pray that every one of you in the next year will be able to help at least one person come to Jesus. It may be a teamwork. It may not be you on your own. Some people are good at pre-evangelism. You know, they get, they get people more relaxed about the gospel. They break down some of the prejudices just by seeing Christians are loving real people who have real struggles. 
Pray for me as I speak to a thousand students this Monday night at Leeds University. At least they told me a thousand. What event do they, a thousand students in Leeds come to? There's only one, Christmas carols. How I've got into this event, I'm still researching, but I'll be there and I'm a little nervous because I'm very sensitive to the prejudices so many non-Christians have, and especially if you happen to be stuck with an American accent. That God can overrule and God can use all kinds of people. Radical grace, radical forgiveness. I told you last night the story of the thunderstorm and the little girl. Would you remember that story and realize you're the little girl? God loves you. He's taking your picture. He wants to use you. You're going to fail. You're going to have struggles. You're going to feel bad. One of the ones who worked for me, and I'll bring this to a close for a whole year, a guy named Matthew Elliott, tall guy. I never dreamed after he left me he would get a PhD in a university in Scotland and he would write a book. He would write a book on the subject of emotion. That's been so helpful to me. I was already learning this, but then he articulated. Have you ever had that in a book? You're learning something and then somehow the author articulates because he has a gift of words that you may not have. And so it's just helped me. It helped our whole movement to realize emotion is important. Maybe you're suffering a bit from depression. That's, that's not unusual. That's not, that's not an illness for bad people. Some of the greatest people in the world have suffered with depression. My own wife went through it for a year. The multi-billionaire who bought the dome recently in London and made a success out of it when it was considered a stupid white elephant that nobody in his right mind would ever touch. He's a bipolar man living in Colorado that's invested in films like Lord of the Rings and loves Jesus, and yet he's been bipolar, suffering with that most of his life. One minute, and for weeks and days, in total depression. The next minute, hyper, you know, making everybody nervous who's anywhere near him. We need to be real. We live in a real world. There will be heartbreaks. There will be sadness. And we have to keep running. We have to keep rejoicing. Philippians, rejoice evermore. Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Thessalonians, in all things, give thanks. That's the message of God's word. That's the message I hope you're taking into your spiritual DNA this weekend and that you're determined that you're going to keep running. You remember that Olympic some years ago where the best runner, one of the best women runners in the world, she fell She fell, and somehow she got up, and I I think she actually won. There's been a number of examples. Wasn't last summer, not this last summer, the summer before. Wasn't that an amazing summer for us here in Great Britain, especially those of us who live in London and minister often in Stratford and just saw the stadium being built from the very beginning. But the thing that challenged me so much about the Olympics was the Paralympics, People with enormous handicaps, enormous problems, and yet they became winners. That's a message for those of us who love Jesus. Yes, we may have handicaps. We may fail. We may have some weaknesses that keep coming back and sort of biting us in the wrong place. But we're going to keep on keeping on. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That your labor is not in vain in the Lord.